This is Twit. Well, we, we've all heard of state-sponsored actors that they've they've looked and tried to to change elections, cause panic on the net, attack companies, but we've we've never really heard about any responses on how to handle this going back going forward. There's a new paper published this week coined the Cybersecurity Strategy Paper and outlines how the US will actually defend our homeland by protecting networks, systems, functions, and data. So some of this content is talks about promoting American prosperity by nurturing and securing di- thriving digital economies with strong domestic in- innovation. It ex- helps expand influence of the open, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet. Now, there's a bunch of blurbs in here. It just keeps going on and on. But essentially what it talks about is how to go on the offense when we have to be on the defense. The paper outlines some things here, and I'll talk about a couple of them. Starting, It starts with the securing federal networks using Homeland Security to secure federal departments and agency networks. It also talks about securing critical infrastructure. Now, it's, it's going to work with private sectors to determine risks, also mitigate more vulnerabilities, and also have swift and concise consequences by using a range of tools against the enemy, including prosecution, as well as economic sanctions. In fact, they are going to also fund research for the National Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience Research to help develop better security. And they also want to include and improve incident responses for all victims and fight back using offensive techniques. Now, it goes on and on and on. But again, basically what it's saying is, we're going to take the we're going to take the initiative here that when things happen we're going to actually fight back and in fact we might fight back in ways where it would hopefully strike a little bit of fear in our adversaries okay so guys i want to go over to you cuz I, I there's a ton of stuff in this document it's 40 pages long it talks a little bit of politics a little bit of information but basically what it comes down to is that the us is going to start fighting back without without telling anybody. They're basically going to say, hey, if, if there's some hackers that are going to come along and they're going to start attacking infrastructure or industries or bureaus or whatever, they're going to start fighting back in some ways. And they don't actually outline how they're going to do that, but they basically say, we're going to do it, so be ready. Now, do, I'm going to throw this over to you, Curtis, first, because you brought it up in the blips. Is, is this is this something that's actually going to make a change? Is this going to, is this going to have veer hackers away from actually doing what they're already doing? Well, I'm actually going to disagree with one of the things you said. You said that this time we're going to go on the offense without telling anyone. I think the the issue is that we have been doing at least limited offensive operations for quite a long time. Right. The difference now is that we are telling people. We are being very obvious about our willingness to do that. Now, before... Anything that we did offensively was always done in the shadows. You know, some you know systems might fail. Uh, DOS attacks might go on. You know, strange things could happen. But we never officially took credit for any of it. And our official position was always one of purely defensive cyber operations for the reason that if the the internet if if cyberscape became an all out battlefront uh at this point it could quite literally cripple the world's economy well now we've taken the gloves off uh to to use a physical weapon analogy we've gone from the concealed carry that so many states use where someone can get a license to, to have, say, a concealed weapon, but they must keep it concealed to open carry. Now we're telling everyone that our cyber defenses are packing and we're willing to use them. Right. Now, one interesting thing here is, and I want to throw this over to Cheever, because I'm wondering if here now we're basically saying that at the very kind of minimalistic side of things, a view of this, is are we just are we just going into a cyber war now? Is that basically what we're doing? Well, to an extent, we have been in one for quite a while. Um, let's use an example. We were running the Interop trade show in New York. And Interop has huge pipes and lots and lots of address space. When you have the 45 slash 8 network, you make yourself one heck of a big target. One of the things we used to do because we weren't allowed to fight back, it was illegal, 
was we had special devices. They're basically pretending to be honey nets. And we had this one hacker and they made a connection into our honey net. And then the device went and did a TCP back off. We actually had this kid on the hook with a TCP back off and then a little bit more and then dribble. And we had him on the line for two days. In the meantime, we were able to go and find track where he was and then hand the data over to the FBI. Well, this kind of thing has been happening all over the United States. I know lots and lots of people that are starting to do this and they're gathering a lot of intelligence. But the laws haven't allowed for anything offensive. We personally had the skills and we had the equipment. We could have dumped on this kid and took down his net, but that's not good. So now with the offensive capability, so-called open carry that Kurt alluded to, maybe now we can go after the kids that don't know, should know better, but don't, and be able to go and deal with them, take them off the line, and then also start dealing with some of these bad actors that are coming from different countries that at the moment, because it's extraterritorial, we can't do anything about. So will it make a difference? I hope so. Will it really make a difference? I think we're going to start having a shooting war. I think it's going to escalate. And then I'm hoping something happens maybe at the UN where will people maybe maybe calmer heads will prevail. I don't know. It uh, could be bad, could be good. It's going to be a double-edged sword if you ask me. So you, you brought up a good point. I want to get back to the fact that you say, could it could it work, could it not work? I think we definitely should talk about that. But I think, Curtis, I wanted to throw it over to you again because then you brought it up in your blip. You talked a little bit about potentially relaxing rules governing the U.S. using cyber weapons. So now, you know, if we know about some of these rules, I'm not sure if you're aware of some of the rules, but if you are, I'd be interested to hear about those. And could they actually affect the American citizens too as well? Well, let's talk about a couple of very concrete examples where I think we could, could see something happen. One is just purely cyber. It is known that um, international government-related organizations have infiltrated parts of the U.S. critical energy infrastructure. We know that they have gotten persistence on the machines controlling our electric distribution grid, uh, on some of the pipeline gateways. There are a number of places where there is no doubt that there is malware in place. So what is our response? Now, traditionally and formally, our response has been that we could go in, root it out, get it off, and do what we could, can to protect the parameter and keep it off. Now, we are saying, although this hasn't been explicitly stated, that if we know who is doing this, and trust me, we do, should they decide to show signs of pulling the trigger on some of this malware, they have critical infrastructure too. And their critical infrastructure could be in as much danger as ours. Uh, think of it as the cyber equivalent of the old mutually assured destruction doctrine that was in use around uh, nuclear weapons for the better part of 50 years. Another one's going to be a little bit more difficult, and that takes place not only within the, the network uh, with things like hacking into the servers and applications of our political parties and of our um, voting infrastructure, but in terms of the, the information, uh, in terms of uh, genuinely fake news uh, and social networks. We're now saying that should someone make use of all of these in an attempt to influence our elections, that we can do the same thing. So I think what we're doing by making this public statement is telling two or three key adversaries, and there's no doubt, to be brutally honest, there are four that we care about deeply. There's Russia, there is China, there's North Korea, 
there's Iran. If we want them to know that whatever they do to us, we are willing to do to them and more. And the hope is that by making that very public statement, everyone will keep their heads cool and the battle won't escalate to a genuine, as Chebert said, shooting war. Right. Yeah, the, the paper actually act, act, actually has accusations against China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. And it actually calls out saying that they are conducting reckless cyber attacks that harmed American and international businesses and our allies' partners without paying costs likely to, det- to deter future cyber aggression. So they are actually directly calling out these 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 places in hopes that they get the message. But uh, it, it'll be curious to see if it actually does anything. Now, now Chibert, I wanted to throw back to you. The paper just actually goes through a little bit of information about how the government wants to get more involved in when there is actually uh, attacks, even hacks that happen, even in the private sector. Uh, and they want to, you know, obviously they have want a better response. They, they want to have to, they want to provide better postmortem on these things. Um, the, the question to you is, you know, they can't really do that without really more uh, a government regulation here, right? Well, I'm going to flip this just a tad. I think this might also be in response to the fact that the private sector is more than just a little PO'd about all these attacks that are happening. Now, keep firmly in mind, just because it's the government doesn't mean they have the best tools. Some, you know, some of these private sector corporations have amazing tools. And, you know, the private sector tends to develop them for the public sector. So keeping that firmly in mind, we're probably going to get some government regulation, but I think it's going to be more along the lines of trying to keep the private sector from having their own mercenary cyber army. To fight back, because that could be, you know, <laughs> that could be the nuclear um, attack <laughs> against some of these people. Because could you imagine, it, you know, some large corporation getting super? Let I'm just gonna do a what if, you know, what if? You know, let's talk about someone that could could potentially get really PO'd if they were attacked. Say someone like Elon Musk, you know, just what if? And if he gets really, really pissed off and he goes and says to his cyber expert, goes, this is, I've had enough of, it's enough. Punish them. That could be like, you know, burning down a forest to get this one person. So I think the government's going to have to do some regulations just to prevent the private sector from striking back or flailing around and creating a lot of collateral damage. Do I want to see this? No. Do we think it's going to happen? Yes. So I am hoping the U.S. Cyber Command actually goes and does something about this before the private sector gets so po that they're going to start flailing around. Um, right. Actually, Emily Strange actually brings up a, a good point in the chat room. She says, you know, we, we might get left behind if because we've been always kind of standing on this high moral ground. Now, if we attack back, it, it kind of positions us a little bit better in this area and hopes that, you know, uh, we don't uh, we, we position ourselves to not be uh, victims in this place. So I think that's a very interesting uh, position. Let's hope it actually happens. Now, Kurt, I wanted to throw back to you. Um, and talk a little bit about, you had mentioned before about some of the critical infrastructures that could be affected here. Um, do you have any more comments about that? Well, for, for the, the U.S., there, there are two primary, you know, broadly speaking, um, critical infrastructures that we worry about. One is energy. Uh, and this is one of those terrible cases where, to be brutally honest, the thing that protects our electrical grid the most is its relatively primitive state. We do not have a fully integrated electric infrastructure. Our distribution grid is divided up, chopped up, and there are some fairly primitive switches between them. So it's possible for a particular region to be taken down, very difficult for anything beyond regional to go down because of one strike. Now, it doesn't mean that a series of coordinated strikes couldn't do something, but those are much, much more difficult to, to pull off. The other thing, of course, is the financial infrastructure. And we have seen the kind of shocks 
that it can inflict upon itself. I mean, we have seen thousand point swings in a matter of minutes. Now imagine if someone were genuinely trying to see just how far they could move a market before the circuit breakers kicked in. What would happen if they started moving the market and they had developed attack, uh, attacks against those circuit breakers? Those are the sorts of things that could have exceptional consequences, as could things against pieces that, that we really don't think about if we're not part of the market. There are um, markets in reinsurance that have massive implications. Uh, most people don't understand how interest rates are set around the world. Those we know from experience can be manipulated. If someone were trying to manipulate them for damage rather than for profit, there's no telling what might happen. So we do have a number of areas where we're genuinely vulnerable. And while we work very hard to protect all of these, the complexity makes it much easier to find a gap, find a seam where an attacker can insert their attack. And I think what we're trying to do with this statement is, is make the, the broad position that even if an attacker finds this seam, finds the gap, and is able to position themselves to do damage, they should worry that we are ready and willing to respond in a way that could hurt them as badly as they're hurting us. Right. Now you bring up a good point. I, I wanted to get Chiebert's thoughts on this. Like they, you know, at this point, do, the question would be, do, do hackers really believe that there's little price to play pay if they continue this? Like, I think it, the question would be if they're, if they're really kind of thinking, eh, if we keep doing it, uh, we won't get kind of reprimanded. Oh, but now we're going to get reprimanded. I, I don't know. Like, do you really believe that this is going to stop anything? I mean, is it, Obviously, we're calling out some different state actors here, specific ones. But, you know, the question would be maybe, hey, is this going to change anything? Or should we have, like Curtis said before, should we have stayed more covert about this and just said, hey, we're going to fight <laughs> back. But that's really it. We're, we're, we're not going to tell you who we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, when we're going to do it. Uh, and we're just going to do it. And I don't know if that would have been a little bit better than just actually calling things out. Question back to you. I'm going to answer this with a what if scenario. And my what if scenario is <clears throat> right now the world is deathly afraid of our current president. He's been known to do a lot of things just based on, you know, whatever he feels like doing. Now, if we start saying we're going to um, open carry and we're going to fight back, <clears throat> There's a really, yeah, thank you. There's a really, really good chance the other countries are going to worry that in the fight back, they're going to become collateral damage. And, you know, cl critical infrastructure, their internet, their financials, you know, all kinds of different things. Here's the part where I'm speculating. I'm hoping that enough people get afraid of becoming collateral damage that maybe, just maybe, the United Nations starts doing something. You know, they've been kind of, you know, not real effective in the terms of cyber um, infrastructure and so forth. But maybe to prevent a worldwide cyber war, we start actually seeing something happening in the United Nations. And if we had something, maybe we can start getting some of these other nations to allow us to go and grab some of these idiots. You know, maybe we'll have some sort of detente, just like we did for nuclear weapons. Who knows? You know, I'm speculating. I, who knows? I'm I'm probably wrong, but I would love to see this happen. I love science fiction, you know. And the reality is, is we're going to have to have a balance of power. And if we don't have a balance of power, the internet's going to become a smoking hole, and the world economy will collapse and things like that. Blah 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 blah. We need to have some sort of balance, and I'm hoping this is a bluff from the White House. 